Comrade Soli, there's no one between uh, you and the task uh, we've given you to speak to us now. Please go ahead. No, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Chesa. And good day, comrades. Uh, thank you very much as well to all the other comrades that have joined us. And let me recognize our provincial secretary in Gauteng, who's our host province, and the leadership of our central committee present here in our provincial leadership and all our structures, both on this platform and those, those that have joined us on other virtual platforms. And to greet His Majesty King Sokolumi Masangu and the royal family of Kamasangu and the entire Masangu family. Prince George Masangu, who also shared some few words with us on behalf of His Majesty and the Royal House, and Davezita, Chief Lucas Masangu, the brother to Solomon, who we have uh, had a great privilege to interface with in recent time as the SACP and our structures in Swani, led by Comrade Buddha. Uh, the Solomon Masangu Foundation, um, I think today is led by Comrade Donald Motwa, who's their coordinator. And we also want to use this opportunity as well, far and wide, to call for the full support of the Solomon Masangu Foundation materially in kind and financial to sustain the great legacy that Comrade Sul Masangu left for our country. And we call specifically our government to do so and to fulfill its obligation and promises it has made to the family. We also recognize the leadership of the ANC led by Comrade Robert Mashehu and other leaders who have joined the, in the platforms. And Comrade Amos Munyela, the Provincial Secretary of Kosatu in Gauteng and other leaders of Kosatu who have joined us in the program. Of course, uh, General Len Raskhatla, uh, I call him Bralen, I'm permitted to do so. Uh, outside protocol, uh, Comrade Lichester. Uh, that's my commander. And thanks for a very moving tribute to Solomon. It could not have been more befitting that um, the comrades have chosen you to present uh, this message today on behalf of um, former MK commanders. We also pass our greetings to all commanders and commissars of the People's Glorious Army, Umkonto Wesizwe. And greet the leadership of our Young Communist League, led by Comrade Tinye Kontini, uh, the National Secretary of our Young Communist League, as well as the National Chairperson, Comrade Mabu Senpi, and other members of the National Committee, and our Provincial Secretary, and all other leaders of our Young Communist League, Comrade Taro, uh, Murifi and others in Gauteng and across the country. And we want to say, we as the Communist Party want to bestow the socialist legacy of Comrade Solomon Masangu in your hands. And therefore, you must get extremely involved going forward actively in sustaining the legacy of Comrade Masangu. We also welcome comrades, a number of our comrades from across the world who have joined us, particularly our comrades from East Asia in Bangladesh. We appreciate that you have joined this uh, uh, lecture today and to observe all protocols. Comrades and friends, on behalf of the SACP, I would like to first convey our most sincere appreciation 
to the family of Comrade Solomon Kalush Mashangu, the Solomon Mashangu Foundation, for collaborating with us in remembering and commemorating this great hero of our people and a true servant of our movement, the gallant soldier of the SYL Glorious People's Army, Umkonto Wesizwe, that we organize to speak at this inaugural Solomon Mashangu Memorial Lecture from the SACP. We deliberately highlighted these celebrations on our centenary calendar as the Communist Party to properly dedicate this inaugural lecture on his birthday, particularly dedicating it to his mother, Mama Martha Masang, who had always wished that he can be celebrated on his birthday than on the day that he was brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. She always recounted the trauma and the pain of April 6th since he was murdered. Because all the time on April 6th when there are celebrations, this reminded her of the pain that the family has gone through. But we must also appreciate that uh, Comrade Butiman Amela, our former national secretary of the young, young Communist League, who's a member of our central committee, who's today also celebrating his birthday, used to take some time to go and spend with Mama, Mama uh, Martha Matlangu and the family to share the celebration of Solomon Matlangu's day on his birthday. We appreciate that, Comrade Buti, and we thank you very much. Next time, we must also go back to celebrate uh, your birthday with the family once more. We apologize as well, Comrade, that we could not celebrate this important occasion as initially planned due to circumstances beyond our control because of COVID-19 pandemic that is ravaging the world and killing our people, especially here in Gauteng, where we are now in the middle of the third wave. But 10 July 1956, when Solomon Masango was born, was a special day for the Masango family. That's why henceforth, we will always remember this important day and share it with our members and with the Masangu family. Today, Comrade Masangu would have been 65 years. And merely 19 days from now will be the official date on the formation of the South African Communist Party, which was formed on the 30th of July, 1921. We celebrate this historic connection to an authentic and dependable special cadre of our movement with the bona fide vanguard of, the, of South Africa's working class for socialism, which we are still advancing in our programmatic slogan, socialism is the future, build it now, as we celebrate our centenary. The life of Comrade Solomon Masang Comrade, it's also a perfect fit to the SACP centenary theme that says, put people before profit. An example demonstrated by self-sacrifice that he made, he made with his own life for a better future, even for freedom of his people. Two things that we want to expand a little bit on today as we celebrate the life of Comrade Galush Matlangu in the year of our centenary. First is that Matlangu was an inspirational young person, a revolutionary youth who lived his life for the benefit of others. He fulfilled the true mission of the worthiness of life. His life presents a best case scenario of the character and quality of the youth that humanity needs today, of the youth that our revolutions need today, if we are to secure for posterity 
the great future of our generations. We learned as well that Comrade Solomon Masangu was a quite humble and respectful young man who, while he was in grade eight, in, in grade 10, what we call standard eight, was recruited into the student protest and later popularly known from the June 16th Soweto uprising and they spread across the country. And that uprising, as you know, was met with the deadly brute force by the apartheid regime, forcing an exodus of young people to leave the country into exile. Others disappeared from normal life into the underground activities of the liberation movement. Many wanted to go to Lusaka specifically to join the People's Army um Caesar. He responded to the immediate challenges of his time. And his task was clearly defined and specific and not sporadic or erratic. He was a disciplined cadre of our movement. Having been recruited into the student movement and protest by comrade uh, Thomas Masuku, who shortly after, together with uh, comrade Masuku and Temba Nkosi and Richard Chauke, left the country through Mozambique to eventually join the ANC and then Umkonto Sizwe. It was very important. You could not join Umkonto Sizwe without joining the ANC first. That was the task when you joined the uh, Umkonto Sizwe outside. You joined the African National Congress officially and then are allocated into the armed wing, in this case, the People's Glorious Army, Umkonto Sizwe. After I've been sent to Angola for the normal intensive MK type military training, Comrade Galush was part of what has been popularly known as the June 16 detachment. And like many other young students and youth, having been forced outside by this brutal, inhuman, and authoritarian apartheid system that was killing our people, he felt the urge to confront the system head on. And I think Comrade uh, uh, Len had shown how, for instance, when they were doing their reconnaissance, they were quite agitated by what was happening in Soweto and what the, 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 the police were doing to the people and wanted to intervene as soon as is possible to stop that. But as you know, Upon his return at this point that uh, Comrade uh, Len had uh, indicated, I won't go there, uh, we'll leave it in our official document, because Comrade Len spoke about this particular question about how they were accosted and how the entire process towards his arrest happened. But the most important thing I want to uh, perhaps as I, I, I jump that part is to recognize the role of the people's lawyer, Priscilla Jana who came from the Ishmael Ayob and partners, and she did her best to represent Comrade Solomon Matlangu. Priscilla Jana will also go on to represent many of our comrades in the political trials across the country. But as his trial unfolded, the state selected the infamous racist apartheid apologist of the prosecution the assessor as well as the judge, who instead of going for the mandatory five-year sentence for a terrorism charge, intentionally invoked the doctrine of common purpose to push for a death penalty. This doctrine attributes the action of one person to the other on the basis of their assumed predetermined trial, I mean, common intent. So Matangu, as you know, shot no one, he killed no one. Bralen also indicated how, for instance, instead of killing people in order to free himself, he made a deal to say, I won't kill you, but don't kill my comrade and don't kill us. It's also important comrades because sometimes people forget the person that accosted them was a black policeman. This is very critical because sometimes today under a democratic South Africa, no black person wants to come out to have been associated with the apartheid system. 
even the collaborationists of the apartheid regime and their stooges. In other words, in this predetermined trial that started in, on the 7th of November, 1977 and concluded on the 1st of March, 1977, with the notoriously cruel apartheid judge, C.D.J. Theron, handling down the death sentence and pronouncing that he must be hanged by his neck until he is dead. This was this judge, C.D.J. Theron. But our movement reacted instantly. The ANC on the same day uh, in Tanzania issued a statement and commented on this matter and called for international uh, community intervention and for clemency. This was uh, followed by repeated state denials of numerous attempts for leave to appeal that also Comrade Glenn spoke to. But the international community and especially the non-alignment movement joined our movement and called on the apartheid regime to give clemency, not to kill Comrade Solomon. The same happened with the United Nations, which made several attempts, including on the 4th of uh, April, just 1979, just uh, 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 Two days before he was murdered, the United Nations communicated with the government of South Africa, requesting that may his life be spared. And as in many other times, through his own appeals, this appeal was rejected. In fact, the register of the Office of the Chief Justice at uh, that time will just simply write a letter to say the appeal is refused. And the appellate judges were not even mentioned. Mr. Uh, Freddie Repkin noted that about this question of these appellate judges who were always incognito. He indicated that, I quote, we will never know from the publicly available records, at least who on the appellate division so fit to send a 19 year old to the gallows, nor a 23 year old convicted for the murder of people whom he had not killed, close quote. That's the injustice on Solon Masango and his family. The injustice against our people by the apartheid regime. But ultimately comrades, the people's soldier, Comrade Solomon Masango was finally hanged on April 6th 1979. This date, according to the apartheid regime, despite international call for clemency and condemnation of their action, they wanted to use specifically this date because that date signifies the arrival of Jan van Riebeck in South Africa in 1652, in which official colonization of our country fully began in full swing. The apartheid regime buried him secretly in Atridgeville instead of handing him over to his family in his hometown of Mamelodi, just the opposite side of Atridgeville. His murder by the state remains one of the greatest injustices in our country. One example of what we may characterize as state terror against a people. And when we were drafting our constitution, we sought also to make sure that the state should not in any way ever act so unjustly against its people. But the following year, despite this international condemnation and protest against the murder of Comrade Solomon Masango. The apartheid regime went on to hang 133 inmates, having hanged by 1978, 145 inmates. These were almost all revolutionaries. We can say, comrades, generally, 
the law under apartheid was used as a blind instrument of a system and a democracy should not allow a law to be used as such because the law, it is a living organism for the fulfillment of justice. Every time the law works, it must fulfill this mission and create equality amongst the people. Solomon Matango leaves a strategic and major legacy for the youth of our country. Last month, we celebrated Youth Month in South Africa. A recollection of that heroic generation, the generation that brought freedom to our people. At only 19 years of age, he dedicated his life to the struggle for freedom from tyranny. He was only 22 months, 22 years, and just two months short of being uh, uh, 23 when he paid the ultimate sacrifice, being murdered by this evil and brutal regime. The ANC commented through President Oliver Tambo after Solomon Matlangu was murdered. And they had this to say to express how this young man has become a titan of our struggle. How he expressed the value system of our revolution. How he responded to the challenges he faced together with his comrades. How he accounted for his own actions. How he never feared the enemy. How brave he was. And he showed how our people have done, have been a brave, heroic people who confronted the most monstrous system. But the ANC says, I quote, in his full but in his brief but full life, Solomon Masango towered like a colossus, unbroken and unbreakable over the fascist liar. He on whom our people have bestowed accolades worthy of the hero combatant that he is, has been hanged in Pretoria like a common murderer. Alone the hangman buried Solomon, bound by a forbidden oath that his grave shall remain forever a secret, because in his death, the spirit of Solomon Masangu towers like a colossus, unbroken and unbreakable over the fascist lion. This was the statement of the African National Congress. Again, they will say a lot of things as the ANC after his execution. President Tambo will also address the people on the 10th of April and spoke extensively about the actions of the apartheid region and expressed once again, the value system of our movement, which we still hold dearly today I'll leave that, that section because it's a little bit uh, a, a longer for the written notes, Comrade Chair, because we'll make this available. But what I, I need to just indicate, for instance, is that his execution posed, according to President O.R., an urgent challenge to the fighting people of South Africa and the international public opinion as a whole to come in solidarity with the people of South Africa against a, a, the system characterized as a crime against humanity, the system of apartheid. When such befell other countries, so should our people also join in their solidarity with them. Umamu Presila Jana, the people's lawyer, once said about Solomon, I quote, that he was an exceptional young man, that when his mother broke down in tears at the sight of him, he asked her when his mother went to see him together with his brother, when they were taken without knowing where they were going by the apartheid regime to, to, to the prison where he was arrested. After they looked at each other and they greeted and he asked how the family was doing, 
she started crying. And Solomon said to her, why are you crying in front of these dogs? I don't care what they do to me. If they spill my blood, it may give birth to others like me. This comes from the excerpt in the Priscilla Jana's book, Fighting for Mandela. And she narrates how the fighting spirit and the resolute character that Comrade Solomon Mashang was. And in the same book, she further says, he said to her, to my dying day, I'll be disgusted that no senior counsel came in. That it was the most distressing, she says, it was the most distressing case of her career. And particularly, this was because there was a mob hysteria, particularly within the whites who chose to believe that terrorists were on the loose in the city of Johannesburg. And it was clear that nonetheless, Solomon had no intention to kill. The circumstances were very clear. She had said, I had questioned him closely and all the evidence pointed to his truth. She further agrees again that he was an exceptional young man. I had never met anyone like him. He was utterly dedicated, quiet, respectful, and cautious towards us, understanding that we were doing our job as well as we could in the face of a ferocious opposition, and that his conviction for murder was a travesty. And indeed, it remains so. These were ex excerpts from Priscilla Jana's book, quoting junior counsel Clifford Mailer. Matlangu was an intelligent young person who committed himself to the life of his people. Priscilla says his mother said he had aspirations to become a school teacher. He was, and that he was conscientious and humble. And he stood firm and unshaken in his beliefs. And at the TRC, his mother said, my mother, that now in old age, I miss him even more. We will celebrate Conrad Masango all the time. And Masango to us is not dead. He will live in us forever. Some of these quotes we have shared with you surmise how this young Solomon Matango dropped from us too early, a bright, aware, conscientious, and committed cater for the cause of his people, a cause of freedom, that he ceased to be partisan. He became a true son of our soil humble and courageous. His humanity eludes many in our current generation and is desperately needed by the current youth and all of us in the revolutionary movement. In particular, the youth in our liberation movement can take a cue from his contribution and his dedication. The spirit of selfless service to the people, the spirit of solidarity, and the spirit to continue the struggle. We therefore want to suggest some few ideas, immediate tasks that young people can carry out in recognition and continuation of Comrade Solomon Maslangu's legacy. The youth can campaign, for instance, for the right to work for all the people of our country, starting with the youth. At the moment, we have youth unemployment that ranges over 60 to 70 percent. A whole generation will be totally lost. In any case, a country that doesn't appreciate the value of labor clearly doesn't understand what wealth is. The primary wealth of human society after nature is labor. That you can have labor of young people 
roaming the streets and tapped into the development of humanity, it's a disgrace to any revolution. But the youth can fight for accessibility to such instruments of production of the moment, for instance, for data, and fight for this, in this instrument to be made a public good, not only to be left in the hands of capitalists and corporations that will use it only for, for profit and not for the development of society. For instance, the Young Communist League can lead a campaign, Comrade Nyiko, to ensure that our country directly confront outside of the current framework, the current challenge of massive youth unemployment. We can have a 24 hour economy as an example, for instance. We have the power, we can legislate for that to happen. If we do so and have, have the political will, but with the mobilization of the youth, we will be able to tackle this massive youth unemployment in our country. Then we can share in the primary health of human society, I mean wealth of human society, its labor to the well-being of all of us. We can share our resources as the youth with our communities and turn even some of our institutions for the benefit of communities as a whole. Unfortunately, we have a, a, a bureaucracy, both in government and even sometimes us in the liberation movement as a whole, that do not want to think outside the box. We have institutions in our communities, schools, for instance, that can be used differently if we turn our society and our community and our country into an effective 24 hour country. If you arrive in Johannesburg anytime during the night, it's so shameful. One of the, of the continent's biggest cities, it's so dead. People have all gone to sleep because their programmed work starts only in the morning. These are the things that we need to, to place on the table to initiate an intervention for the well being of our society and especially its youth. There are other specific things that we can take up, for instance, the fight for a public banking system, a youth bank, a student bank, and several other community-led uh, initiatives that can have financial institutions supporting the interventions that we are making as a people. At the moment, for instance, in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, we needed not only a bureaucratic posture towards the vaccination process. But we needed a volunteer system involving young people of our country to participate in the mass inoculation and vaccination of our people. But the way things are done, it's as if only through the government system things can happen. It can be. We therefore also need young people to defend the national democratic revolution, to defend our democracy, to defend our constitution and further to develop them, not just only to defend them, to develop and advance them. And also to consciously fight against the capitalist system that breeds hunger, unemployment, and exploitation of our people, and especially for the youth. We must agree with Comrade Inyuko. Capitalism is thriving whilst the world is dying of malnutrition. This week, for instance, there was uh, something, I don't know, Comrade Lesh, you have picked that up. The ninth person was admitted into the so-called exclusive club of billionaires with over 100 billion US dollars per person. The ninth person. We are soon going to have so-called trillionaires. What kind of a world we live in that individuals want to amass so much wealth, which they will die and leave behind in any way? whilst other people are suffering. So this happens, this admission of this 9 billion person with 100 billion uh, US dollars to their name, when the world is in the midst of a health crisis, the coronavirus pandemic, 
and the capitalism itself, it's causing wars from Palestine to Swaziland, Sudan, to Kurdistan, Western Sahara, to Syria, all capitalist engineered wars. So this system, young people have to fight against it. It is also important, comrade, that in our discussion with the family and also with uh, uh, Comrade Len, he does indicate, the family does indicate that actually Comrade Sol Galush Masangu interfaced and interacted with Marxist, Marxist Leninist literature as a high school student in Mamiloti. And he has always kept with him a secret copy of the Communist Manifesto and that of Das Kapital. He showed both political and ideological discipline ahead of his own circumstances. One of his contemporaries, for instance, from Mamilodi, attested that Comrade Kalushi had already secretly aligned himself with the communist while he was recruited into the ANC. And he used to have clandestine engagements with communists in the local township. Nonetheless, he was a cadre of our movement, a cadre of our people. But what is important is to appreciate the fact that even in his young age, he interfaced with Marxism Leninist ideas. And we can believe that these are some of the ideas that truly strengthened his resolve. We already know, for instance, that even in MK camps, the ideological and political uh, education and training of MK members was grounded in Marxist Leninist theory and practice. And moreover, some of the key instructors were leading communists in the movement. For instance, Comrade Jack Simons, that we have now named our national political school after. Comrade Mark Schoppe and Comrade Joe Slov and several others. But his discipline and his astute intelligence and understanding of the South African struggle and the revolutionary mission for which he was incarcerated and killed resembled a character of an advanced cadre. And Priscilla Jana again noted in a book that during his incarceration and throughout the trial and afterwards, he utilized his time to give his fellow inmates political and ideological education and training in strategies and tactics for struggle. The discipline that he exhibited during the moments leading, leading to his capture, during the harrowing torture and beatings, being interrogated, leading to his trial, also elucidate further on the astute level of training in revolutionary theory and practice and that he had gained and internalized, even leading to making the ultimate sacrifice without compromising the struggle for which he fought and died for. The quality that he exhibited, comrades, was truly synonymous with many life stories of cadres, especially those imbued with advanced ideological commitment and the struggle of the people of our country. The South African Communist Party and its role particularly in building a cadre of Matlangu's caliber cannot be underrated. Sometimes in our revolution, we also suffer from the theory of erasure of communist ideas and communist influence and communist role in our struggle. This must be rectified across the country as we celebrate our centenary in every community. All communists must rise up, they must raise their hands, must be known, must be celebrated those who have passed and their activities must be entrenched amongst the people. We cannot hide our activities. But the supremacy of scientific analysis, of articulating theory and practice, even of merging the relationship between theory and practice itself as a key element of our Marxist-Leninist strategy remains critical. And in exile, any typical MKK 
and later comrades in the underground uh, uh, structures and those in the trade unions, for instance, and our community civic organization who wage various struggles were not influenced by emotionalism, but by clear programs of action emanating from the precise strategies and tactics, as well as precise reading of material conditions on the ground. We can attest this without fear of contradiction that one of the glaring weaknesses in our movement today is the absence of such strategic engagement in many of our formations. However, where those engagements, for instance, take place, they are overwhelmed by capitalist interest and aspirations. We often hear some people calling for political education and ideological vanguardism, but they want nothing revolutionary in them. In the sense, they have become opposed to revolutionary transformation of our society, either because of their capitalist interests or aspirations. And yet they can call for political education. The political education that must be induced in our movement must seek to transform our society, to change the way our people are living. In other words, if we don't do that, revolutions can suffer from constant period of stagnations and even reversals. But many failures and setbacks, for instance, in the post-apartheid economic trajectory can be summarized or traced to the relegation of Marxist Leninist praxis, replaced by the ascendancy of identity politics, nationalist chauvinism, narrow nationalism, emotive populism, as well as demagogy and outright opportunism and the like. This we see, for instance, in the chaos fracturing in the political space. For example, the split and splinter political formations that are happening almost every elections and more than anything else in the private wealth accumulation and other private interests and aspirations that are characterizing this splits happening in various political parties. Our alliance movement, for instance, and organization, the ANC, even the trade union movement had not been spared of this. Even the Communist Party, some members that left the Communist Party went on to create their own institutions. So post-1994 analysis points to this, but it is weakening the unity of the revolutionary movement, which is so crucial if we are to advance the interest and the mission that Comrade Solomon Matsangu stood for, which was to create a united democratic and prosperous South Africa, free of exploitation of men by men, non-racial and non-sexist. In order to continue to do this, we have cases where, for instance, the movement expels some individuals because they form their own parties or they lack discipline, and later on they were brought in, sometimes even showered with serious pol uh, uh, political positions inside the movement. We can say this also in the trade union movement, for instance, that between 1994 and today, the trade union federations have split from three into several more. And at the height of trade union mobilization, for instance, in 1998, the trade unions in this country represented above 45% density of workers in formal employment. Today, trade unions combined represent less than 24% of formal workers. This is a major decline of working class power, which we must seek to harness as the Communist Party, so that in our centenary, we must reach out more to the workers, to unite workers, so that we can face the common enemy, which is a big capital. Therefore, one key challenge facing our movement is to strengthen ourselves. We don't strengthen ourselves if, for instance, we are characterized by the issues that Comrade uh, 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 General Ras Khata was raised. But as we commemorate Comrade Solomon Masangu, we should also reflect and afford ourselves a thorough analysis of our struggle today, the gains that we have made and the setbacks of the struggle. For instance, in our movement lately, there are, we are more synonymous with individual squabbles for the spoils of power, for the spoils of corruption, and the dismal absence of comradely comrades elected to serve communities, 
as well as the growing hegemony of neoliberalism in policymaking in most of our critical functions that are entrusted on us by our people, particularly as we are leading our second more radical phase of the National Democratic Revolution, which must lead us to recognize that the fundamentals of Marxism, Leninism, political and ideological training are so critical and that the NDR must focus itself to resolving the immediate task of the people. When we celebrate, and I think Comrade uh, Mashangu, George, Prince Mashangu was actually speaking to this particular point about the relevance of our political struggle to our communities, servicing our people, the common uh, uh, language in our, in our movement. But we commemorate Sulu Mashangu comrades during the darkest hour of our democratic order. On the one hand, for instance, the scale of corruption and state capture by private uh, profit interest has not only robbed us of the actual gains of our freedom, but it has severely affected the capacity of the state with almost all SOEs looted to the floor by individuals once entrusted to lead our revolution. This we have to rectify. This is why, for instance, the SACP, we insist on the significance of rebuilding our state capacity, which must include in the rebuilding process, arresting the drainage of corruption of resources and state capture. Hence, we continue to support the work of the Commission of Inquiry into state capture and allegations of uh, corruption and fraud. Because as, as is all well known, we were the first organization, political organization in this country to call for the establishment of this commission. So the commission was our doing. Although formally, later on, uh, the public protector, advocate Tulima Donzela came to the same conclusion as, as us after she received a complaint and investigated it. But we were the first when we were confronted that we kept on blaming the Guptas, but we have no proof. We said to the president and in public that if the president wanted the proof, he can establish a judicial commission of inquiry, found all the truth. That's how this commission ultimately came about. But the issue here is not whether we, we, we were the first to call for the commission or not. We're just stating a fact. We, we support in our case as well, investigations in ongoing corruptions, including on PPEs and COVID-19 intervention uh, 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 resources, fraud against them. That is why we want also the strengthening of SAS, South African Revenue Services, to not only run after ordinary taxpayers, but to deal with the scourge of illicit financial flows, for instance, and deal with a myriad of nefarious activities in tax evasion in the private sector and by corporations. Therefore, we are opposed equally to austerity measures and any attempts by austerity apostles parading themselves as messiahs. That austerity and neoliberalism is the only way, the only way, the truth and the only life. That's absolute madness. The revolution must be able to respond to this kind of things and refocus itself to focus on the aspirations of the masses of our people and the mission of the revolution. Hence, comrade, we are vociferously in support of the institutions of the state, our courts, our legislatures, and our executive to each do their part in executing their task without fear or favor, and to bring those who steal from the future of our children and from justice, to, from our, the future of our children, bring them to justice. This is extremely important and it must be done without fear or favor. But it is worse, comrades, when those who steal the future of our children, the future of our society, are wearing are, are, are wolves who are wearing sheepskin, are those who are entrusted with the actual very task of advancing the national democratic revolution in the context of our conditions in society. I heard our two provincial secretaries of the Eastern Cape and Gauteng talking about the thoroughgoing. I thought they were talking about the thoroughgoing democratization of our society, the national democratic revolution. 
In other words, comrades, we should say it is unforgivable to betray the masses of our people. Sorum Maslangu never betrayed the masses of our people. To betray them is also to betray him and the many other matthias of our freedom struggle. I must note, comrade, that the discipline of communist conviction is exemplified in the strides that we've been made and are continuously making as experienced by other communist countries, as we learn also in our country, by the people of Vietnam, for instance, the people of China, the people of Cuba. And similar to us, the communist part of China is celebrating its 100 years this month. We have joined, we have begun joint activities to celebrate their centenary as we celebrate our centenary as well. We can draw important lessons, comrades, from China and its steadfastness in defending Chinese independence, exercising national policy sovereignty, and advancing the aspirations of the Chinese people. Viet Vietnam is doing the same. Laos is doing the same. For instance, Vietnam, after the devastation of the American imposed war, it is coming up and increasingly in the last decade has been very decisive in reducing poverty and underdevelopment. China had pronounced, for instance, last year, just in the midst of the pandemic, that it has taken out every Chinese out of abject poverty. This is a great stride, not even any so-called first world country has achieved. We have seen again in other countries where good achievement in the scientific world and achievements have been made in other communist countries. Cuba have just made a big stride in achieving the development of COVID-19 vaccine, Soberen. That is highly effective. And it has assured the Cubans that all of them will get a Cuban vaccine. And they did so because they said they wanted to be vaccine, vaccine sovereign. They didn't want to rely on other people for the lives of their, pe of, of, of their people. So it is important that as we fight against vaccine imperialism, vaccine apartheid, and vaccine nationalism by the Western countries who are awarding more vaccines, who are buying more vaccines than they need when the world is short of vaccines because they are trying to commodify the vaccines. Therefore, when we pay tribute to a great hero like Solomon Matlangu, we must always go to the basics, comrades. But we are paying him this tribute, as Comrade Lechisa is saying, in the conditions of today, like O.R. Tambo indicated. Our country today is passing through a crucible moment. And our revolution is being tested, sharply so. We are facing difficult choices, and we have many difficult choices and, and, uh, uh, to make. On the one hand, for instance, we have to strengthen our revolution by addressing its weaknesses and immediate challenges facing the people. Or we face further weakening it and ultimately destroying it by our hesitance and reluctance and even half-hearted response to many challenges that we face. We have been thrust in the labor of our rebirth by the conditions on the ground. In other words, the subjective facts us is in crisis. The leadership is in crisis. In other words, the leadership of the revolution is in crisis and unable to deal with the objective condition afflicting the masses. Who have now become restless and are easily triggered into reaction by multiple factors that ordinarily would not create a crisis. So we have to respond to this, these questions, for instance, as a movement. The ANC and, and its allies must face the internal crisis in the movement head on. We must summon a deep sense of perspective and have a firm grip on the psyche of the masses and a firm grasp of the conditions facing our people. They are living in economic conditions and address those things. Because to look after people, comrades, and progress with them, it's a 
great foundation to deepen our revolution. The revolution cannot succeed if the people are not looked after well by the revolution itself. They cannot even make sacrifices if they think the revolution is self-saving. Therefore, to make the revolutions and to serve the people will be also a great honor to heroic fighters like Solomon Masandi and his peers who died fighting for our freedom and, and democracy that we enjoy today. Indeed, the real secret of a successful revolution is to look after our people very well. On the contrary, comrade, we can also say the demise of any revolution is when those in power leave the well being of the people in the hands of the market and the unelected owners of capital. We must confront equally inside our movement the infamy and the disgraceful conduct inside our ranks, irrespective of who commits them, and never patronize our members, particularly when they do wrong things just because they support us. And we must reject even unprincipled peace that only lasts for the duration of our meetings. Because every time when, for instance, you read, and I was very happy, Comrade Lechisa, last week, uh, this week, to read earlier during the week, a statement of the NEC of the African National Congress. Once a very reassuring statement, clear and firm and decisive. I agree with General Len. We need that. That's what we think the ANC leadership is elected for. Therefore, comrades, we should also enforce compliance of collective decisions and defend these decisions as well as a movement. We must learn from our mistakes. Our revolution, comrade, is based on the superiority of its ideas and comradely persuasion. But once the movement has taken collective decisions, it's our task to implement and respect those decisions and to defend those decisions, not to question them willy-nilly. We must therefore not forget the ABCs of our revolution. This is where we should start and reorientate ourselves. Otherwise, comrade, only anarchy and turmoil will prevail and it will not be possible to run an organization. In this regard, for instance, it is, it is important to give you a quote from Fidel Castro, who when his own revolution was faced with similar challenges. In a matter that they characterized in, 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 in Cuba in 1880, 1980, 1989, sorry, as the, the matter they call cases one and two. This involved a very senior leader of the movement in Cuba, uh, Major General Arnaldo Ochoa Sanchez, who was one of the few 82 cadres with Fidel who left Mexico to go into Cuba and participated in a revolutionary armed struggle to overthrow the dictatorship of Batista, one of a special few of that glorious revolution. But that member was corrupted in later years and dealt with drugs and dealt personally with the drug lord called Pablo Escobar. And the revolution had to respond to his case. And the prescribed judgment was death sentence. I want to give an excerpt of what Fidel Castro said after the court have said he must be sentenced to death, as an example. And to reverse that decision, he could only get clemency from the state council, in this case, the cabinet. The cabinet agreed with the court, but in their law, there's something that also allows the presidency to give clemency. And Fidel had to address the people on this matter. You could imagine for a senior comrade who was highly decorated and even had the medal of the hero of the Cuban revolution, like our East Talan. This is what Fidel had to say, brief quote. He says, I quote, a true revolution 
will never permit impunity. The party and leadership and government leadership stated from the start that if serious moral or physical ill arise amongst individuals, absolutely nobody in our homeland, no matter how great his merit or how high his position, may violate the principles and laws of the revolution with impunity. The revolution has been generous on many occasions when it could be so without doing mortal damage to itself. Now, the revolution cannot be generous without doing itself serious damage, close quote. So in other words, the conditions that we face today in our movement lead us to accept our constitutionalism, our democracy, and the best we could do is to learn from it. Our revolution has redefined itself by affirming the supremacy of our constitutional democracy, the supremacy of the rule of law, and the equality before the law of all South Africans and all in our country. During this crucial period of difficulties, we have the choice to choose peace, justice, and freedom as a people than the tyranny of the mob and the self-saving infighting of the political class in our country. We must reject violence and the implicit calls for violence and the shutdowns that have been called and narrow nationalism that is emerging, that has been mobilized. So whilst we are rejecting all of this, we should also call for calm and say we should not ourselves be triumphalist. We must call for unity and for the respect of rights of all South Africans as enshrined in our constitution. This is the democracy that Comrade Solomon Mashangu fought for. He fought for justice and the rule of democratic law. We are a people of justice, not a people of revenge. We must use this period to learn from our own mistakes and weaknesses so that we can correct them. We cannot learn by invoking every reason to be right when we are wrong and start vilifying everyone to prove our case. Equally, we cannot be triumphalist comrades once again because the tragedy has befallen our movement. The best is to learn from this tra tragedy and how to come out of it. Towards conclusion, comrades, I want to express on behalf of the SACP, our solidarity with the people of Swaziland, who are having serious ongoing struggles for democracy in that country. And to call on the government of Swaziland to immediately stop the violence that they've unleashed against Emma Swat and to unban political organizations and unconditionally allow for the return of all Swazi exiles and engage in talks for a democratic dispensation in that country. Already, just the last few weeks, over 54 people have been killed in Swaziland by the state. It should be highlighted, comrade, that a state that kills its people, like what happened in Swaziland, has effectively embarked on wanton state terrorism and neglected its own legal instruments. Such a state should be isolated by democratic forces. SADC in particular and the AU, as well as the UN, must actively intervene and stop this massive killing of innocent civilians in Swaziland, particularly those that are known to belong to People's United Democratic Movement and the Communist Party of Swaziland. It is therefore critical that South Africa plays a leading active role towards the resolution uh, of the crisis in Swaziland and for a democracy in that country. We want to say, comrade, on this year of our centenary that we are initiating with the Solomon Masango Foundation, the annual Solomon Masango Lecture on his birthday, one of the key contributors of Marxism, Antonio Gramsci, once said, 
a socialist struggle was not just about theorizing on ideology or the centrality of ideological training and education of the working class in order to advance, for instance, real struggle for socialism. But he observed that the crisis of capitalism in Europe in the period after the First World War, attempts by communist parties in Italy, in Germany, in France, in Spain, were brutally squashed. And Gramsci himself was imprisoned. Rosa Luxemburg faced similar conditions and ultimately died in Germany, 1919. And to add salt to injury, the working class in Italy allowed a fascist paternalist dictator, Benito Mussolini, to rule over them. We will commit such a great error if we allow a paternalistic dictator to rule over us just because they may have been members of our movement or even leaders of our movement. We should reject that because that will be a descent to anarchy and tyranny in this country. In this observations, comrade, Gramsci highlights the significance of ideology as a key factor in mobilizing the working class for revolution. Solo Matlangu, the Solo Matlangu lecture, for instance, and the SACP political school and the re-establishment of the Krizani Brigade and other myriad of programs of the SACP must consolidate the ideological thrust of our movement to create new Solomon Mashangus, new cadres that are stilled in the quality of Comrade Solomon Mashangu. We ask the youth of our country today, once again, to defend our democracy, to defend our constitution, to fight against the tyranny of capitalism and the unelected bosses who want to enslave us even when we fought for freedom from hunger and exploitation by other human beings. We call upon you, the people of our country, to end this capitalist economy and create a public sector-based economy to be dominant in our country and safeguard the interest of all, not allow the market to rule over us and we still continue to account for poverty in our country. Therefore, comrades, my last note in this inaugural Solma Sangu lecture, we want to remember his exemplary leadership by picking up his peer where he left and enjoying his prophetic injunction that my blood will produce many Solomon Masangos to come alive today, to inspire us once more, to go back to the values of our revolution, and that the basic measure of our revolution can at least be atoned by his conscious commitment in his final hour to the love of his people. Oba Masangu quoted Cheko Vara. Solomon was of that caliber. And May each one of us comrades that are present here today say we want to be Solomon Galushi Masango or else know that this beautiful country and this beautiful nation will be destroyed by self-interest when we put the revolution aside. And indeed, as the Ghanaian writer once observed, will continue to say, the most beautiful ones are not yet born. But for Solomon Matlangu, we want to enjoy Nikolai Ostrowski, who characterized a life well lived as much as Oliver Tambo did after his death. And Nikolai Ostrowski said, I quote, Man's dearest possession is life. It is given to him to live only but once. He must live it to the fullest so as not to suffer petty past of torturing regrets that one day when dying, he might say, all my life, all my strength was given to the finest cause in the world, the liberation of mankind. 
close quote. To Solomon Masangu, you lived well, our dear comrades, our hero. Today, we join all South Africans, remembering you, and pledged forever keep your legacy and example, your revolutionary example, that will never allow anyone to take us back. We will only march forward as a people to see and realize the values encapsulated in our constitution and in the Freedom Charter and many intentions of our movement so that our people can live in freedom, true freedom and peace that you died with your blood. Indeed, your blood is nourishing the trees that was bearing the fruits of freedom. It's now in our hands to fulfill that mission. We want to thank you for your contribution to our struggle. And we want to take this opportunity once more to thank the Matlangu family and to pay tribute also Mama Sang and say to her, we will always celebrate your son's birthday as you wished. Your wish, it's our command. Thank you very much, Comrade Chair. Long live the undying spirit of Comrade Solomon Masangu. Long 